American 199 Lindbergh. Got out of American 199. Uh, yeah, we're having problems with our number three engine. I'm requesting flyby to uh, let you check us out. Roger that. Anytime you're ready, we'll keep a lookout for you. Number three. Roger that. We thought we lost that engine. Thanks. No, I'm 99. I mean, you lost the engine. As in, it's gone. Repeat. Your freaking engine is physically gone. Holy crap. American 199 declaring emergency. Please have all the equipment you got when we, uh, if we land. Roger that 199. We'll have everything waiting for you. Good luck, mate. Tuesday, April 17, 1985, was just another sunny spring day across the United States. At least that's what the passengers of American Airlines Flight 199 thought. The Boeing 727 built in 1972, just 13 years old, not bad in aircraft years, and had nearly 37,000 total hours on the airframe, was powered by three Pratt Whitney JT-8 D9A engines. About halfway between Dallas and San Diego, as Flight 199 soared at 35,000 feet in the azure skies high above the picturesque white sand dunes of New Mexico's Chihuahuan Desert. One of the passengers on that fully booked flight that day was Audrey Ward. Audrey was sitting towards the rear of the plane near the Whisper Jet's three engines. In case you weren't aware, the 727 with its three tail engines was one of the loudest aircraft ever produced. However, its manufacturer Boeing actually bragged that the new jets were quieter than any other engine, dubbing it the Whisper Jet. But that's a story for another day. Anyway, about an hour into her nearly three hour flight, while she was serenely sailing the sapphire skies high above the U.S. state of New Mexico, just as Audrey was being handed her old-school full-size can of ginger ale and little plastic cup of ice, suddenly she said there was a tremendous bang, adding it was like a big explosion. But it was at that exact moment, Audrey said, suddenly the plane started violently shifting from side to side as the oxygen bags started dropping down throughout the cabin as the plane continued to shudder. It was then that Audrey cried out, Dear God, I can't believe this. Well, somewhere between dear and God, Audrey said the pilot came on the PA and said, Obviously, you passengers in the back of the plane know that we have a problem. To which Audrey told her seatmate, Well, aren't we lucky, Martha, we have Captain Obvious flying our plane today. Well, that may or may not be true, but it does sound like something I would have said. Anyway, the flight crew told the terrified passengers, Just want to let you know that we felt the vibrations here in the cockpit and we're checking on it. A few minutes later, Audrey said the pilot announced that the number three engine isn't turning, but we don't anticipate any problems. She said it was at that point the plane began a steep nose dive, recalling that they had dropped from 35,000 feet to just 2,000 feet above the ground. Well, I'm guessing it was more like 10,000 feet, but hey, she was terrified, so it probably felt more like 2,000 feet. But either way, Audrey said, I mean, we were flying low, really low, really close to the ground, she said. It was at that point that the pilot announced, we're going to determine whether we're going to go to the next airport, Phoenix, or continue to San Diego. Later, he said, we're just 55 minutes away from San Diego. So we decided we're just going on in. Well, that was a poor choice of words. But a visibly shaken Audrey said those 55 minutes were the longest of my entire life. And she emphatically stated, I don't think I'm traveling for a while. It was a very emotional experience, she said. When we touched down, the whole plane applauded. However, although the plane eventually landed safely and nobody was injured, what none of the passengers knew was actually just how dangerous the situation they experienced really was. But the American Airlines Boeing 727 carrying 81 passengers and 9 crew members landed safely at San Diego Lindbergh Field at noon that April Tuesday in 1985, just 45 minutes after the first signs of engine trouble over Deming, New Mexico. But what the pilots, the crew, and most of the passengers did not know, which would have terrified them even more, was that the engine didn't just seize up or stall or fail. Instead, they literally lost that engine, 
And not in the metaphorical sense either, but in the actual sense, as in a 3,000 pound engine was violently torn away from the 727's fuselage. Oh, they would eventually find out, but not just yet. But while still in the air, preparing for landing, the pilots decided to ask the Lindbergh control tower to allow them to ride into the danger zone and do a Top Gun Maverick style tower flyby to see if they could spot any anomalies before they attempted an emergency landing. Jim B., the air traffic control manager for Lindbergh Control on that day, said the airport was put on alert status. When the pilot, identified only as Captain Greiser, notified the tower that, quote, they were experiencing only minor difficulties. So, of course, the tower gave American 199 the OK for a Goose and Maverick style flyby. However, when the plane passed the control tower, Controller B said, we noticed that the number three engine was indeed having a problem because there was no engine where the number three engine should have been. But the 727, of course, has three engines and all are mounted on the tail of the aircraft. One in the tail of the fuselage with the other two mounted on each side of the fuselage. And Controller B said that the right engine had broken away clean. However, while still in the air, none of the flight crew could have imagined that the engine had actually been sheared from the aircraft. They just assumed it seized up and they couldn't restart it. So that's why they asked for the tower flyby for a closer look. According to American Airlines spokesman Jim Stroop, the pilots did not know the plane lost an engine, he said. You can't see the engine from the cockpit. But Linda Johnson, a spokeswoman for American Airlines, said, We don't know why the engine separated, and we still don't have any idea where it is. Oh, and don't worry, I'll get to where and how they found the engine in a minute. But after landing, the jet was taxied to a hangar where investigators from the NTSB were trying to determine the cause of the engine separation. And it was at this point that a spokesman for Boeing dropped a bombshell revelation on flight 199's passengers as well as the 727 flying public. And that was that the 727 was actually designed for this to happen. It was an engineered safety feature. He said when the engine stops all of a sudden or seizes up for some reason and the blades stop turning, it tends to wrench the engine severely and twist it. So to avoid damage to the plane, the engine is designed to drop off. But then Boeing revealed more unsettling news that other 727 engine dropouts have actually happened a couple of times in the past. And I'll get to that soon too. But it has been a fact that many aircraft, including Boeing's older 707s, incorporate shear bolts in their engine mounts to allow the engine to drop off. Of course, people on the ground may not be too excited to hear that. Well, then what happens if you lose more than one engine? Well, one of my first videos to go viral had to do with three of four engines on a brand new Boeing 707 that had sheared off on a delivery flight in the late 50s. If you missed that one, I'll include a link down below. It's really an amazing story. So later that afternoon in April of 1985, back in New Mexico, John Gorman, assistant Albuquerque air traffic manager for the center, said the pilot reported a malfunction and requested a lower altitude, and we gave it to him. However, in the Chihuahuan Desert later that day, an airline crew found the crumpled 3,000-pound engine pod about 26 miles east of Deming, a town in the southwest corner of the state. And a Boeing spokesman once again repeated the statement that if enough kinetic energy and torque build up, the shear bolts are designed to break loose rather than remain on the fuselage where it could take a piece of the plane with it. He said he didn't know how much pressure or torque had accumulated on the American Airlines plane, but added it was preferable to having an engine fall than to have an entire airline break up in such an emergency. However, when asked about the risk of an engine dropping on a populated area at the time, Mellon said this is such a rare occurrence. This is only the second such incidence that we're aware of that a 727 engine separated like this. Oh, that's such a Boeing quote. Only the second incident so far. Kind of like other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Anyway, he noted the FAA had approved the shear bolt design, adding that the entire plane is FAA certified, and the FAA is involved in the design right from the very first day. And as we found out 25 years later with the Boeing MAX disasters, that's not always a good thing. However, by 1985, it was already the second time an engine had fallen off a 727. 
So that brings us to the conclusion of this story with the NTSB's report on the Boeing 727 and its habit of spontaneously shedding engines over populated areas. On August 14, 1990, the NTSB and FAA officially adopted recommendations that all 727 operators need to follow to keep engines from ejecting from the airframe, albeit 25 years after the defect first appeared. Then finally by 1990, the NTSB and the FAA figured out what was causing the engine ejections. The cause was ice ingestions into the engine which also caused impact damage to the airframe. It noted a history of ice-related incidents resulting from the formation and subsequent release of ice around or near ground service panels, and the report cites multiple examples of 727s encountering this problem. April 30, 1974. The number three engine separated from a National Airlines Boeing 727 while in flight 60 miles east of El Paso, Texas. The cause was ice ingestion. April 16, 1985. An American Airlines Boeing 727, the subject of our video today. This, too, was also caused by ice ingestion. On January 16, 1989, a Boeing 737-300 operating as Continental Airlines Flight 137 also suffered an in-flight engine shutdown. On January 4, 1990, a Northwest Airline Boeing 727 from Miami, Florida to Minneapolis-St. Paul experienced a separation of the number 3 engine at 35,000 feet. Then again, on 12 February 1990, an Eastern Airlines 727 didn't lose the engine, but it did shut down. The FAA finally discovered that the ice buildup wasn't due to the weather or atmosphere, but leaks under pressure from the lavatory toilet tanks installed in the 727 incorrectly, allowing for a buildup of that dreaded blue toilet ice. So finally, in 1989, the FAA issued an airworthiness directive that required repetitive checks for the forward lav service panel leaks on the Boeing 727 series of airplanes. And since 1990, there hasn't been another 727 engine ejected from an aircraft due to the dreaded blue water lavatory ice. Well, as we conclude this story, it's kind of refreshing to know that the FAA and the NTSB have always been lousy at their jobs. And with that, the rest is up to you. Have you heard about the 727 engines falling off? Have you ever experienced one personally? I won't know until you let me know down below. And as always, thank you for stopping by. Until next time, yeah, this is Maximus.